Welcome to our program today, Character Creation for Role Playing Games, part of our International Games Month series. I'm Becky, I'm a librarian with Hillsborough County Public Library, and I'm here today with our program presenter, Scotty. Hello. I'm going to hand things over to Scotty now and let him get started. Scotty? <laughs> okay, no pressure. All right, Good so. Time. Obviously, you guys are here because you want to create a and d character or a role-playing game character. Um, so what I want to do is just kind of go over some of the basics, over, overriding basics for this. And the reason for that is because there's a lot of different options that are available. There's a lot of different things to look at and think of, and they can get daunting. Um, and that's the last thing I want anybody to be is daunted at trying to figure out, like, how. But I'm, I want to come up with the greatest character ever. Um, so that's kind of what I want to go over today. Um, so basically what's going to happen, and we've got some resources and stuff that we're going to give at the very end. Um, and there's links to, to different things that I'm going to be talking about, plus a lot of other information. Because with D&D &D and really any role-playing game system, you can dig as deep as you want, and there's, there's going to be something there for you. Um, so basically, uh, what you want to think of in in starting this is uh, what what kind of character do do you want to play? What type of character? What what do you want your character to do? That's really kind of what it boils down to. Um, so you know, we'll get you a link to a, to a character sheet, and I'll I'll go over kind of what a standard D and D character sheet looks like, and go over a couple of the different section so you'll kind of know what you're going to be feel, filling out because you're getting a blank sheet um and you're basically just you can be tempted to fill it out on the computer which you can if you really want to but it's easier if you actually just print it out and do it on pencil um and the reason for that is because there's really nothing in this game that is permanent um anything that you have that you think oh this is going to be this forever it probably won't you're going to change weapons over time. If you're a spellcaster, you're going to change spells over time. As you as you level up, your hit points are going to change. Those are all things that, you know, you're going to be over there erasing and rewriting and, you know. So anyway, basically, like, when I first started playing D&D, &D, I was pretty simple. My my character, I, I was kind of in that Hulk smash mode. Uh, you know, very little finesse. So, you know, for instance, I chose a barbarian. Um, it was a lot of fun, and sometimes it wasn't. Um, and what you find over time is that as you start picking your race and your class, there's going to be upsides and downsides for each one. Um, and so that's kind of to help balance anything out so that you don't end up with characters that are really OP or are really hamstring in an area. So there, there's, there's, there's pluses and minuses. And if you're starting up with a DM, They'll kind of help you with some of that, but just know that they're also going to be testing the balances on on the regular. So if you do have a blind spot with your character, it, your DM is going to use it, your dungeon master. Uh, for instance, my my uh, my barbarian was um, well, he 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 was just big and a bunch of muscles, and so we had uh, our party was was going in and having a discussion with a, a diplomat and he wasn't giving us the answers that we wanted so my barbarian was like fine i'll smack the answer out of him and so i slapped him he, he didn't give us the information that we wanted and things got bad for us very quickly so then it became what does the party do with the barbarian when they're having sensitive conversations? So we were able to kind of play around with that within the game setting, but you're never, you know, there's going to be certain aspects that your character just isn't going to have. So if you, for instance, want a character who's a smooth talker, you're not going to be looking at kind of your muscle barbarian, you know, half orc, any of those types of characters. Um, so there let's go through so basically what we've got like and, I, and i'm speaking more specifically to D, &D um, these are a lot of things that will cover over into other rpgs 
Uh, for instance, uh, if you look at your basic races in D and D, um, there's dragonborn, dwarf, elf, gnome, half elf, halflings, half orc, human, and tieflings. And while those same characters might not be available in another RPG, there are going to be characters that fit those slots. So, for instance, if you're looking at like Dragonborn um, or Half Orc, um, any of those guys, uh, they're tieflings. They look a little more monstrous. So, for instance, if you want someone who blends into a crowd and you know you don't want an entire village to stop working and stare at you, then you might not want to go with Dragonborn or Tiefling or Half Orc, one of the more monster looking uh, races. And so, there's you know, that that's kind of one of the things that you take in place. Now, that having been said, if you really, really, really want to play a Dragonborn, then okay, that's fine. Just know that it's going to come with a few other challenges that will actually kind of challenge your creativity at that point. Because then you're going to have to figure out, how do I get my Dragonborn into town without everybody freaking out that, you know, there's a, a human-looking dragon walking into town? Um, so that's, you know, just know that those choices have consequences on the backside. Uh, and I am put, uh, leaving a link in here that is going to give you a full breakdown on each of these uh, races because they do have different benefits. You know, so for instance, there are going to be certain uh, races that are better for, say, being a rogue, a thief, you know, someone who's sneaky. You're going to be looking at like elf or half elf or maybe even a half like because that's like a hobbit. They're half the size. Um, you know, if you're looking for someone that's all muscle and brawn, then okay, go look at your half orc or your dragonborn or your tiefling. Those guys are super strong. Dwarves are really strong. You know that kind of thing. So, you know, it's it's kind of this idea, and I think part of it is is some people come into D and D with a fully formed character, which is fine. Um, but it can cause issues as you're actually trying to create them on paper. Um, you know, I think if you're starting out, maybe leave your backstory a little loose. Uh, it gives the entire party a little something better to play with. And it also allows everybody to learn about your character at the same time. So it's not like, you know, you walk in and say, uh, yes, my name is uh, Fenoric, and I am a tiefling prince, and this is my entire life history. And then it, you're just kind of reciting it. It doesn't give your fellow players a chance to really get to know you. Um, I'll, I'll just throw something out in a recent, uh, a recent um, campaign we did. It was originally done as a joke. Uh, one of our characters decided he would take an entire ham from this dinner buffet and it was like okay what <laughs> what are you doing like he grabbed an entire ham he's not a huge character he's just a normal human but what ended up happening was the ham thing kind of became a little character quirk for him so that if there was a full ham somewhere he was gonna take it didn't really matter what kind of chaos it would cause he was going to take that ham. And so then it became a, a balancing act like with the DM and with the party going, okay, how can I as the DM use that against the party? Or how can we use it as an opportunity to maybe lighten the mood? Or, you know, uh, for instance, after a particularly nasty battle when we had lost someone, uh, you know, when they got back to their, their sanctuary area, there there was a spread laid out for them and there was specifically a ham just for him um, because it kind of helped ease some of the tension of the room. Now, he did not walk into this game going, yes, my name is Baldrick and I like ham. You know, it just is something that happened organically. And I find as a DM that that is like the best way for it to happen. So what you'll do on your character sheet, and I'll kind of go over some of the sections of the character sheet is as you're filling things out, you kind of, you want to make a skeleton 
And then as you play, those experiences are what's going to put meat on the bones. And then that's what's going to help develop your character um, as to kind of bring them into a full realization as a person rather a than, well, this is an idea I have. So that's that's kind of the, the breakdown of the basic races. Um, and then also like when you look at classes. So that's your next thing is like your race is physically – what do they look like? When you get to your class, um, that's going to be like, what's their job? What do they do? You know, so um, not to put too fine a point on it, but most of, most of the classes tend to filter down into two main archetypes. You have fighters and you have spellcasters. And that's, you know, and there's some serious overlap because you do have characters that can do a little bit of fighting and a little bit of spellcasting. And it kind of depends on, I think this is where you're going to figure out the finesse for your character. Like, what, is, what do they do? Like, my Barbarian was Smash only because, I, I don't know, maybe it was because I was an angry teenager. Maybe that, I have no idea, but that's what I wanted. I don't play Barbarians much anymore. I like to mix things up and make crazy stuff myself. But you've got, like, your Barbarians. Every, I know everyone's heard of a Bard. Uh, there's Clerics, Druids, Fighters, Monk. Paladin, Ranger, Rogue, Sorcerer, Warlock, Wizard. Now, don't get too worried. This is all in the resources. Um, you know, like I said, your Barbarian is super strong. Your Bard is a music player. They tend to rely on their charm and charisma as a performer, but they also instill inspiration into a group. They can get into a bar, uh, like a bar fight, but they're not what you would consider a big heavy, like they're not going to go raging into battle. They're the guy that's going to be sitting on the sideline, giving everybody inspiration so that it pumps their stats and makes them stronger. Uh, clerics, when I was originally started playing, they were the soccer moms of the D&D world. They were the ones that said, oh, hey, here's a healing spell. Here's this to make you feel better. This will make you a little bit stronger. They sat in the background. Um, somewhere along the line, by the time we got to fifth edition, clerics are, they're, they're, um, they're pretty awesome now. Um, there are so many different types of clerics that you can choose. The, uh, there are battle clerics, and they're the ones that the, the magic they know is what makes their weapons stronger or makes their their opponent's weapons weaker or makes their teammates stronger for a section you know it's they're they're way better and and again there's some of them that focus on only healing and they're some of the clerics in the in the order of life are really good like they'll just start making everybody heal up faster you know they're good to have depends on what you want to play Druids, those are the guys that are animal shapeshifters. Um, fighters are your most rounded uh, battle people. There's there's a couple of different orders within the fighting, um, but there are you know, hey, I'm a battle master, or you know, there and, and there's a couple of different options even with a fighter. But they're the ones that are the most balanced. They can kind of pick up almost any weapon and swing it and do some decent damage. Monks are kind of what you think of, you know, Shaolin, kind of, the, they're really big in like martial arts, hand-to-hand -hand combat. The monk is actually, I believe, the only class right now in DV that absolutely cannot cast magic. Um, so you're, you're not, you can't, <clears throat> like, so it, some people will multi-class, they'll maybe run two classes. Uh, you're not gonna get like a monk wizard it's just they don't they don't mix. So, you know, but if you want your guy to if you want to do, um, let's say you really like playing Street Fighter, you know, and Ken and Ryu or Hudoken, you know, the energy ball, you can actually make a monk that punches so hard that it shoots out a wave of energy. You can almost make, uh, you know, Ken or Ryu through the monk class. So this is kind of where I'm talking about, like, what is it that you envision your character being? So paladin, for instance, they are great at fighting, but the thing with paladins are, is you have a very strict code that you have to follow. Otherwise you fall off of being a paladin who is a right and good person, which means if you are playing a paladin 
and someone in your party does something that's a little morally ambiguous and you turn your back on it, you actually have a chance of losing your blessing and going into the dark paladin uh, side, which is kind of the, the, the evil paladin. Um, Rangers, that's, you know, they're great for tracking, running through the forest. They're not good in cities, but they're great in the wilderness. Um, you know, if you're playing an, uh, an epic outdoor adventure, Rangers are great. Rogues, they're your thieves. They're the ones that have to have some stealth. So you really want to work on your stealth roles. You don't want a, a giant person playing a rogue unless you like the idea of that dichotomy. So, for instance, we, we had an instance where um, I used a half orc and played a rogue. Um, and we, we, we homebrewed a bunch of stuff to make it work. But for his idea of stealth was, is he had what he called his stealth tool. And it was a rock. And he would hit people on the head with it. And when they would fall down unconscious, he was able to pick their pocket, go through, do whatever he wanted to do and not get caught. And for him, that was stealthy. You know, we were kind of playing with the trope. Um, it also was kind of hard <laughs> getting into cities quietly with this guy. Uh, when you get into your magic casters, there's sorcerers, warlocks, wizards. Your wizard is the guy or the girl who, who learns their magic through study. So, like, their stats are really going to be looking more towards, like, intelligence and wisdom. Versus the sorcerer is someone who's got their magic through some bloodline. They are just naturally tapped into this magical field. What that does cause, though, is there's a little bit more chaos in their magic. Um, so you have to, some if you fail on a magical save, sometimes you have to roll on what they call a wild magic table. And... It may do bad things. Uh, we we've had uh, we've had instances where uh, one of our characters' hair started growing one foot per round of combat. Um, so by the time the fight was over, our character was also being buried under this horrendous haircut now because their hair was so long. And as we were trying to cut it with axes, it was growing, and it's you know because it was on the wild magic table. So there's. And then, then you have the uh, warlock. I forget about them. They're the ones that made a deal with the devil, so to speak. They have found an extra planar entity um, and said, hey, I'll give you a little bit of my soul if you give me a little bit of your magic. And they make a deal with their with, with whoever that, that entity is. And that will dictate kind of how they use their magic, whether it's in a good or evil sort of way. Um, so yeah, so like with fighting, it's you're like your barbarians, your clerics, your druids are good fighters, your fighter obviously, monk, paladin, ranger, bard. Spell casting, oh look, the druid, the cleric, the bard, <laughs> the rogue is in there. Um, and then you've got your sorcerer, warlock, and wizard. Um, and so there's a lot of overlap in there. And then one of the things that we get to after we figure out uh, your class and your race is where we start looking at proficiencies. And proficiencies basically just means it's, what is it you're good at? Um, and there's so many proficiencies. Like a, you, you could, like if you were a, a barbarian, you might get a pro proficiency in intimidation. Where basically you could just give people an ugly look and they automatically like, you know what, um, they have to roll. They'll roll with disadvantage and they'll be like, well, I'm intimidated. You get your way. Um, there's uh, so many like you pick your instrument. If you play a bard, there's lute, lyre, flute, drum. There's all different types in there. Um, there's martial weapons. If you're a monk, the unarmed uh, combat is another good one. So, you know, it depends on your, your character. Um, so, for instance, if you, there's a poisoner's kit that you could get proficiency in. Um, that works really good if you're a rogue, you know, if you're in there getting the sneaky stuff. It doesn't really work for anyone else. So, you know, you kind of, you, you get a feel. 
And it, the list is huge, and it's absolutely completely overwhelming um, if you just look at it at face value. Um, so if we could look at the uh, the breakdown, the character sheet breakdown. Is that something we can put up on screen? Oops. I can't put it up on screen, but it is in the handout. So people can okay. go to the handout section and you can okay. open it up and view it there, everybody. Okay. So if you want to do that real quick, just click on there and open up. It's I basically, it's a really general uh, character sheet breakdown. Um, so what, what you kind of see when you look at it, um, to start off with the top, you, there's the blue box is kind of L shaped. It goes character name. You've got class level, race, background alignment. I generally skip alignment player name. That's your name, obviously how many experience points you have. And on the right hand side, you'll see there's personality traits, ideals, bonds, and flaws. And so generally what you're going to want to do when you're setting up your character, this is the guts of who you are as a character. So personality traits. Maybe one of your character's personality traits is that they don't like silence. So they'll always kind of pipe up with something if the room gets too quiet. They'll crack a, a joke on occasion. And maybe it's a bad joke, but they don't care. They just don't want silence. That could be a personality trait. A personality trait could be that if they were royal born, maybe they're a little arrogant. And that's one of the personality traits that kind of helps you inform as you're role playing. Like if you are a, a royal born descent, and something happens, you're going to be a little bit more on the, <laughs> uh, you need to say a sir or a madam or give me an honorific when you talk to me. Because, you know, that's a thing that helps inform how you play your character. Ideals, you know, maybe one of your ideals for your character is that nobody should be hungry or that greed is good. You know, like it's it and depends on how that character is. If you've got a rogue and greed is good, that fits great. Um, bonds. So under bonds, that's something that will change over time. So what's going to happen as you get a group? So let's say you guys are in a battle and you don't really know each other right off the bat, but you know you've got to team up and you're doing a thing, and you've got this one character that says, hey, you're looking kind of bad here, and they hand you a healing potion that they didn't have to do. They kind of pulled that teamwork mode, and it helps you out. Maybe that's a bond you have now, and that's going to be something that, that's a little bit stronger. Like you're, you're like, no, now if something happens with this character, I want to help them out. Not because I feel like I'm in debt, but because that was a nice thing to do, and that makes me like that person a little bit better. Your bonds can also be negative bonds. Um, they could be where you absolutely do not like a character. Um, I try not to get into some of the the more some of the tropes that come out, like oh, all elves hate all, you know. And it's like no, it. I there, just this is just me. And this is how I DM. We have enough racism in the world. I don't need to put racism in my game. So when I look at alignment, I don't tend to look at alignment as someone being lawfully good all the way down to chaotic evil. Because there are certain characters that D&D &D used to say had to be evil. Like a dark elf. If you were a dark elf, you had to be evil. Well, we broke that in my game. Uh, the, the last campaign we just did, one of my characters was not only a dark elf, she actually helped take down the, the, uh, the uh, I guess, the deity that the dark elves had been praying to, only to find out that all of the dark elves had been kind of brainwashed. And they kind of come out of the caves going, hey, whoa, what's going on? And everyone's like, oh, you're evil. And they're like, oh, no, we're not. You know, and we tried to break that that idea that this type of character is always this way. Now, if you want to play it that way, that's fine. 
but I don't like to just sit there and say, oh, this is how it has to be. Um, so yeah, you can have negative bonds, not because, oh, I'm an elf and I hate dwarves, but maybe I'm an elf and I hate that particular dwarf because of something they did. Um, and maybe that goes down in and, and you have flaws on the bottom. Every character needs at least one flaw. You know, maybe the flaw is that they're just a little too optimistic about the world. Maybe the flaw is that they're a little too greedy. Maybe the flaw is, you know, they don't respect leadership or, you know, whatever. You put that flaw in there and that helps you dictate who you are. Now, if you look at the red box in the middle here, You've got armor class, initiative speed, your current hit points, temporary hit points, hit dice, and death saves. This is where the majority of change is going to happen on your, on your player sheet. Um, your armor class, it'll change depending on what you're wearing um, or if you get, you know, once you level up. Um, initiative is what order you fight in. So as you go through you'll uh, you'll get maybe a plus two to initiative and if you do that well then that means whatever you roll for initiative you add two to that and you go further up in the battle order um your hit points that's the one that's going to change the most because you're going to get hit you're going to get healed and sometimes you'll have temporary hit points is if you have a potion it'll temporarily give you something or uh we we had a a an instance where they were using a uh, kind of an exoskeleton uh, armor that gave them current, you know, temporary hit points, but it was basically the armor had the hit points. Once that was destroyed, that fell off, and then it went to their current hit points. Um, death saves, that's obviously if you die, you don't die immediately, you die incrementally. So you have to do three rolls, and you roll your d20, and if you make the save, that's a success. If you succeed three times on a death save, you go to one hit point, you're still unconscious, but you're now healable. If you get three failures out of your rolls, if you get three failures before three successes, then your character is dead. And if there's no resurrecting anywhere in your game, then you just need to re-roll a new character. That's just how it is. Your hit dice, that'll tell you what you need to roll. Um, like. You know, you've got your D10s, your D8s, your D6s, some are D4s, and it's going to depend on, on your character. Um, now, to the left of this, you'll see the green box. It starts with strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence. I've got a smaller version on the right-hand side. Um, these are the ones that you're actually going to be rolling stats for. That's strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. And this is going to be dependent on what kind of character you choose. So if, for instance, you choose a, uh, a bard, you're going to want your charisma way up there and dexterity because they're a performer. So that'll help with acrobatics. That'll help with athletics uh, checks, your charisma. That will help you if you have a performance um, proficiency, which means if you're telling a lie, it gets really hard for people to discover whether or not you're lying. Um, plus, the, the charisma is just that you're exuding charm. Your presence will tend to de-escalate situations just because you come in with a shiny smile and say, what's up? You know, um, charisma is not going to do any good if you're a fighter. Um, you're probably, you know, you're going to be looking, if you're fighting, you're going to want to put that in strength and dexterity, maybe in constitution if you're a barbarian, because that'll help with your hit points. If you're a magic caster, you're going to be looking at intelligence, wisdom. Um, those are the ones that you're going to want to put your higher stats into. And I guess we can get into the basics of this is kind of how you make your guts. So there's several different ways. Um, I included a link on here for no fewer than 12 different ways to create a uh, a d and d character. I'm gonna go over your the basic ones at this point. Da, da, da. Okay. So back in the old days, it was a lot harder. You just took four d6, that's your standard six-sided die. You rolled, usually you took three. 
and you rolled those and you added them up and you got what you got. And your first roll that went to strength, your second roll went and you went down the line. Well, if you got a really good roll on strength and you were like, but I was going to play a wizard. They're like, well, I guess you're just a really strong wizard now. And it didn't really work. And, and, it, and it made things kind of not fun. So they've come up with different ways. My One of my favorite ones that I've done for a while is that you roll 4d6 and then you take away the lowest one, whatever it is. You're like, boom, done. There's that, you know, that's that's the one I kind of have grown up doing the most. Um, and then what you do is you do that six times. So let's say if you roll your 4d6, you get a four, a five, a two, and a six. Well, you take away that two and then you got a 15. Um, so you write your 15 down and then you do, you do the six times total. And then that way you, maybe you've got a 16, a 12, uh, a seven, a 13. Then you take your character sheet and you say, okay, where do I put the really high rolls? What are my highest rolls and where do I put those? If you're playing a wizard, you're going to want to put that into your wisdom. Um, and I'm, I'm providing a link as well. That'll kind of help you out with that. Uh, so for instance it'll it, it'll show all the different classes so it'll say for instance it'll go with barbarian um your primary ability is strength your saves are strength and constitution so you're going to want to put your highest stats in strength your next highest stat in constitution um if you're a bard your primary primary ability is charisma your saves are usually dexterity and charisma so again Put your biggest one in charisma, your next one in dexterity, so you can be quick and nimble. Um, cleric, you got wisdom and charisma. There's, you know, so the 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 link I'm providing will actually help you out with that deciding where where you kind of dump your biggest rolls into. Um, and then you have what are called dump stats. So you're going to hear the word dump stat um, as you dig in and start reading into D and D stuff. Dump stat basically is What's the most meaningless thing in here so that I can, like, if you get a horrible roll and you get like a six, this is, that's, that's a terrible thing. Where are you going to put a six? Well, depending on your character. So if you are a wizard, well, put it in strength because you're not going to be out there punching people and swinging swords. So you'll, low strength is fine. So you'll have stuff like that. So dexterity is the exact opposite of strength. So if you have heavy armor, dexterity is a good dump stat. You know, so if you need to be strong, you know, your barbarian doesn't need to be dexterous. He needs to be able to carry that heavy armor or your paladin needs that heavy armor. Then you put it into dexterity. So um, constitution is I would never, ever, ever use that as a dump stat, mostly because anytime that there is a poison, a spell, that you're always going to be doing constitution checks, uh, you, you're you going to need, that's, that's where your health, uh, your saving rolls, all of that, <laughs> constitution, you need that. Don't ever do that as, uh, as, a, uh, as a dump stat. Um, intelligence? You know, um, there, there's just certain ones. You put those low rolls. If you're not playing someone that needs to be particularly intelligent, you know, uh, do that. Same with charisma. If you're playing Dragonborn, go ahead and drop it on the charisma. Put that low roll because no one's going to like you anyway. You're a big giant lizard walking around town. So anyway, some of the other roll options that you have, um, you know, instead of taking the 4D6 and taking the lowest one, there's another option where it's called 2d6 plus six. And basically what you're doing is you're just rolling 2d6 and adding six. So it keeps the, it keeps it so that you absolutely cannot roll below an eight for a stat. So you don't get anything that's just truly horrible. Um, it kind of keeps everybody a little bit stronger, a little bit more even keel. The 3D6 way, like I said, in the old days, that was, that was bad, <laughs> you know, um, it was just, you got what you got and, 
you know, you might just sit there and roll a really horrible character. And it doesn't make you really want to play the game if you have a character that you're like, well, he's he's horrible in every level. This is bad. I don't want to do this. So the idea is that you know, you want a character that you can be proud of. Um, and your and and your 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 dungeon master, your game master, DM, GM, it's the same thing. Um, some of them won't let you pull your roles. They'll just say your first roll goes here, your second one goes there, your third goes, you know, strength, dexterity, constitution, etc. Um, I don't like playing that way because it does kind of take some agency away from you in how you create your character. Um, most most DMs and GMs that I know don't do that. They let you just put it because I think we've all realized that the game is the goal of the game is to have fun and as as a gm for me if my players aren't having fun they're not going to want to commit to a 12 week campaign they're not going to want to save the world they're going to be like well this kind of sucks i don't want to do this so you know i tend to homebrew a lot of my stuff and homebrew means you take some rules that you don't like and you just throw them out and you take some rules that you do like and you play with those. And sometimes you just change rules accordingly. Um, my, one of my favorite things that I like to do is when someone goes to make an attack, I ask them like, what do you want to do? What do you want your character to do? And they're like, Oh man, I want this character to run up, do this sick backflip and throw a dagger while he's doing it. Okay. That's not technically a, legal attack in D&D. But I'm like, all right, let's let's see how we do this. Maybe they have to make two rolls to make the attack happen. Um but if they make those two rolls and they do that sick backflip while throwing a knife and it hits, that's pretty cool. Like, ooh, hey, hmm, I might want to do this. I've had, you know, guys like I want to run up a wall and stab a dude from behind with my sword. Okay, let's see how that works. And they have to make an athletics check to be able to jump up towards the wall and then they still have to roll to see if they hit, you know, I like playing with that idea because it allows my players to do some really crazy and creative stuff. Um, and, and that's, that's really for me, what, what it's really all about. Um, I think I've probably thrown a lot at you. Um, so I am, I'm actually ready to open this up for questions. If, if uh if that's okay I, it's a little early but i'm i went i went over a lot of stuff it's a lot of information for sure yeah no that was great great overview so yeah everybody keep uh submitting those questions i did put the resources that scotty was talking about into the chat box so you guys can check those out um so let me see some of our questions um are there other role-playing games that are similar to DD? &D? Yes, there are. There are a lot, actually. Um, and this is, I actually, one of the things I put in there is there's a Wikipedia list of all of the uh, all of the tabletop wow. RPGs out there. Um, one of the ones that I actually like, and it's it's related to so D and D, um, is Spelljammer, and mm -hmm. Spelljammer is basically Dungeons and Dragons in space. And so, it, you know, there's spaceship settings. It's there's. Di all of the species are completely, you know, there's still some overlap, but there's a bunch of different species. Um, there's an older one, Forgotten Realms was was a big one. Uh, there's a, another one that we used to play was called GURPS, which was, I think, generic universal role play. It, it allowed you to basically create any character that you wanted. And so... I took, I had a, uh, a cartoon character that I used to draw when I was a kid called Commando Cal. And he's basically this seven foot tall bipedal cow who, you know, beats people up. And I took the archetype of a minotaur, but then made him not evil. And, you know, so now here I've got this, I, I had this seven foot tall cow driving a motorcycle and he had a baby dragon as his familiar on his shoulder, you know. And that's stuff that you can't really get in D and D. Um, I mean, there's mm -hmm. Star Wars. Star Wars has mm -hmm. a really rich RPG setting. Um, it 
if you want to get out of the actual role playing side and just into tabletop gaming in general, I mean, you've got um, Warhammer 40K. That's kind of more military uh, strategy type stuff. But you still have some character play within there because you're the general of this army. Um, I mean, there's just there. Oh, there's so many out there for basically any flavor. I've played, uh, and I was not good at it, but um, I played. It was like a 1940s era detective noir uh, setup. So it was, you know, like this little cheesy 1940s um, uh, detective movies. And, you know, you're trying to solve crime through there. Uh, Lord of the Rings, actually, they've got a role-playing game. So even if you're not into, like, the D&D side and you want to go with Lord of the Rings, um, you know, there, there's, there's, there's an RPG out there for just about <laughs> anything you can think of at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 vampires. It's uh, Ravenloft. Uh, that's part of the D&D setting, but it's all vampires. So if you're into more like goth, uh, there mm -hmm. is a um, Stranger Things expansion for D&D. So you can actually go into the Upside Down. I've played it. I have never been more stressed out in my life yeah. than when we went to the Upside Down and like everything is just, you, you're just like, okay, this tree is probably going to kill me. Is that rock? Mm -hmm. It's probably going to kill me. You didn't know where it was coming from. I've we played that for three nights and I was, I was a bundle of nerves. I'm just sitting there picking my nails. You know, I'm like, that, I, ugh, stressful, but it was a lot of fun. That sounds great. It's great to know there's so many options. Another question is what suggestions do you have to start a group if you've never played before? Aha, uh -huh. that, <laughs> <laughs> that's a little bit rougher. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's basically the the hard part is is never like you have to find a DM. Um, if you've never played before, running a game is going to be infinitely harder because you're not going to have the experience of how do I handle this situation, um, and the game can become overwhelming really quickly. There are I want to say on Discord, there's um, a lot of RPG via Zoom that goes on. There are, because I've got a friend of mine who I kind of introduced her to d d Now she GMs and she plays, I think at one point she was playing four nights a week with three different groups. Um, and it was, you know, signing on to Discord and, and, get, and going through that way. I don't know the exact channels that she was going through, but, you know, I know those are those would be places to look. Um, I know when we were in person, I was running a, a kind of a one shot uh, every few months. Whenever they did game night, I would come in and we I would just pre-roll five characters. The first five kids that came and sat down with me, we would kind of run through to give uh, a little bit of a of a of a an intro. But then what it did was it allowed the kids that were even coming into the library system go, hey, wait a minute, you play d d Do you know anybody who, do you have a spot at your table? Um, because sometimes they do. They're like, yeah, I've got a table. I've got an opening. Do you want to come in? Um, you kind of have to reach out for it. And again, as with anything, trust your gut. If something feels a little skeevy, don't do it. Like that's that's really my number one. If you're not having fun, don't do it. Uh, mm -hmm. One one person can ruin a group, and you know, I mean, like I had, I I'm not real big into specifics myself, but I had a DM who, you know, if his characters when they set up camp for the night did not specifically say, yes, I remove my armor and get ready for bed, well, I just assume you slept in your armor, and now they were three days into their journey and he's like hey make a constitution saving roll for me and they're like why uh failed it okay you took one one point of damage from what and he would make them figure out that they now have really bad you know jock itch or you know because they didn't take off their armor and it's like oh you're being ridiculous stop it that's too too pedantic but there are gms out there like that and if you get one and that's your field go for it but if you get that and that's not run 
there, there's nothing holding you into a game if you're not having fun, period. And if your GM can't make the game fun or work with you on it, then that's not a group you need to be in. That's great advice. Okay, we have time for one more question. How do you come up with your campaign ideas? There are so many books out there. And this is and this is where my plug for the library is. Um, as you're getting into this game, <clears throat> there are so many books and they all cost like 40 to 60 bucks a pop and they're expensive. But the Hillsborough County Library System has them and you can set them aside. You can you, you can borrow them for a couple of weeks. Um, I go through basically I check out a book and I read it. And if I like the information in it, then I'll just go buy that book. Um, depending on how you want to operate it like there are full books that have an entire campaign that says okay when you open it up as a dm it says you're starting off in hillcroft and here's a mystery that's happening and here's what ha you know and it it lays it out for you or like what i what i've done in the past and it's a little bit riskier but it's kind of one of those like all right i have an idea for the end game in mind and then how do we fill that in to get them to from point A to point B? So what I would do is say, okay, the first day we need to have a little mystery in this town that bonds these guys together. It's a dinky mystery, but it was a mystery. And so we did this and it was in what I thought was going to be a throwaway setting. That setting ended up becoming their basis of operations. It became everything to them they were willing to die for this city by the time it was mm -hmm. done the people in the city were willing to die for them you know and it, it it was all completely organic because of how the team coalesced and said oh no we have to protect this because mm -hmm. they got one guy on the docks who was really funny and they liked him so they're like we need to protect him he's a national treasure so you know, they're, they're, if you're coming up with them on your own, I mean, there's so many places that you can Google story ideas there, even within the DM's guide, um, the D&D &D, uh, Dungeon Master's guide, there are really good tips and pointers on here's certain elements you need to include. Um, and it's basically what you're trying to do is to get your characters through the hero's journey. It's really what this is all about. Are they a reluctant hero? Are they an eager hero? Are they the hero that no one saw coming? You know, that's going to be up to each individual character. And as the DM, you kind of figure this out, you know. So maybe you've got a character who's a reluctant hero. And so you just kind of turn the thumb screws on them a little bit. You add more pressure to them in a certain evening. Um, you know, a lot of it's going to depend on your group. Uh, but what I've done is I've historically gone through, like there, there's tables. You can just roll the dice and it will say, ooh, there's a political uh, figure in town and mm -hmm. a gold seal comes up missing. Well, what does that mean? You know, who did it? Oh, well, there. then you roll again and it's like, oh, there's a, an ancient sect is is being blamed for this. Which ancient sect? Oh my gosh! And it—that's what gives the players the impetus to jump in. Um, I personally, I have a hard time with a lot of the pre-written campaigns because they can be a little stilted, but they are really good for farming out different um, encounters. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's kind of what it boils down to. And 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 it's if you're if you're wanting to GM yourself. I would say, you know, go to the library. If you have, if you find the book, go ahead and just sit and read it for a while at one of the tables before you check it out. Um, but if the library doesn't have one of the books, you know, you can go to Books A Million and leaf through it and just kind of get some ideas. Um, like I said, I, I've got several books in my collection, but not a single one of them was purchased without me having either checked it out from the library or really done some reading in it to go, okay, no, this is worth the money I'm spending on it because it can get expensive. Um, but it doesn't have to be. So if you're playing really with three, with theater of the mind, you know, pen and paper, I mean, really the original D&D &D was literally four guys sitting around a table with a pad of paper and a pencil and an idea. 
and they told these epic stories there there were no set pieces included there were no miniatures none of those existed um they didn't even have a book to say like this was this was like some of their their original um encounters that they come up with were ones that they played themselves mm -hmm. um so yeah it's it's it can be as simple or as complicated as you want it to be i have found that the simpler side of it gives my players more freedom to breathe and express a little bit of their own individuality because the players will surprise you with their creativity. They will do things as a GM and like, I, I would not have done that. <laughs> and now they did it. And I have to figure out how to handle this. And I live for those nights because those are the ones where we're having, we're laughing. It's, I mean, we're having a great time because that's what you should be doing, having fun. <laughs> I totally agree. Game, game should be fun. <laughs> All right, so that's actually it for our questions. And we'll see. All right, so I do want to thank you for answering this question. I want to invite our audience members to go continue the experience from this program with these books we have. We have Fantastic Worlds, The Inspiring Truth Behind Popular Role-Playing Video Games by Thomas Kingley Truth. And it takes a look at the true history behind the monsters and role-playing games. And we also have Dunces and Dragons Online Edition Starter, Characters, Rules, Tips, Strategies, Game Guide Unofficial by Chala Dar. It's an unofficial guide, as it says on the cover. And it's an unofficial guide to playing Dungeons and Dragons with an overview on how you get started. And both of these books are actually instantly available on Hoopla. With Hoopla, there's never any wait to get the item you want. You just need to go and sign on to the app and you can download it immediately. So those you don't even have to come into the library to check out, but we do, like Scotty said, we have plenty of books on D&D in the buildings. So you can always put those on hold if there is a wait, if it's not at your local branch. And let me see. This is our contact page here. So if you have any questions for the library, you can reach us at our website, hcplc.org slash contact, or you can give us a phone call at 813-273-3652. To reach Scotty with additional questions you may have thought of, you can email him at scotty.schrier at gmail.com. All this information will be on our YouTube channel. So if you did miss anything, you can go and review it. It should be up soon. And if you enjoyed our program today, we'll have more programs for International Games Month throughout November. The next one is actually on Friday. You can view all of our library programs at hcplc.org slash events. I want to thank everybody for joining us today and extra thanks for Scotty for leading this program. We appreciate you being here with us. So thank you for having me. I had a blast. <laughs> and if anybody sends me an email, I will try to get back to you as soon as possible. I don't always check that email address every single day, um, but I do try to check it at least every few days. So, you know, be patient. But if you do, if you do email me with a question, I yeah, I will answer it to the best of my ability, and I might give you more information than what you need. I I like copying and pasting different websites because I'm on, I don't know, I at least ten or fifteen different D and D websites to mm -hmm. for different resources for different things. So yeah, mm -hmm. like I, I'll send you as far down the rabbit hole as you want to go. Yeah, there's so much information out there. That's one of the reasons why we had you do this program tonight, just kind of give a little interview, uh, overview, and get people started. So thank you so much. And we'll say good night to everybody. Great, have a wonderful night. What was it? Live long and prosper. <laughs> yes. <laughs> thank you so much. Good night. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.